Thank you, guys. I'm so excited to be here with you tonight. I was asked to come and share my testimony, and I hope that more than my story, you hear a story of God's faithfulness. It's God's faithfulness in my life, but I hope that it's just an encouragement to you of God's faithfulness in your own life as well. I thought I was courageous once. At 18 years old, I decided to move across the world to a small village in East Africa with nothing but a suitcase full of crayons and construction paper and a heart determined to change the world for the gospel. I was bright-eyed and determined, full of naive optimism that I had labeled hope and a somewhat silly boldness that I had called courage. My mom and I had visited and volunteered at an orphanage during my senior year in high school over Christmas break. And I had fallen in love with the beautiful and joyful and gracious people of Uganda. So after returning to high school and applying and getting accepted into many different colleges, I actually decided to forego college for a year and take a gap year and go live with a pastor and his family that I had met who ran the orphanage in Uganda. They had asked me if I would come back and help them start a kindergarten program for the children in the community. And um, I was excited about the adventure, I think. My heart was on fire for Jesus and on fire to serve, and I was so excited to be doing something new and different. And you know, I I look back, 18 years old, and and I laugh and I shake my head. sometimes at my 18-year-old self and the spirited young girl I once was, I now have an 18-year-old adopted daughter at home, and I think, oh, I would never let her move to a different country. (laughs) No chance. Um, But, you know, I say that, and at the same time, I admire that younger version of myself. I admire that willingness to just go, just do, just love, That younger version of myself didn't overanalyze or overthink or have to have the plan just exactly worked out. I just went. I just leapt. I just listened for God's voice and followed his leading. And I cannot deny that God used that willingness even though I was young. So that was 16 years ago now. And slowly, quietly. Jesus has replaced my naive optimism with a true hope, a hope that has grown out of being tested and tried by fire, not a hope that just waits for the good outcome or hopes that my prayers are answered in the way that I want them to be answered, but a hope in eternity, no matter what happens here on this earth, because I know that I am going to be with him I think now maybe I have more of what I once thought courage was, a true courage, a faith that he has given me that relies on him no matter what, that has known him to be near no matter the situation. I didn't know it then when I packed my bags and boarded a plane full of answers and excitement and my desire to change the world. I didn't know just how many answers I truly did not have. I showed up that very first day to teach kindergarten, being told that I would have a classroom of around 30 students. Having packed and prepared for that many students with all of the enthusiasm in the world, and instead of teaching 30 students, 150 pairs of eyes stared back at me. It seemed to be like this many people, but crammed into a space of like this big. Um, My classroom was a barn that they had just packed all the kids into, and so it smelled like a barn, and it was very, very hot. Um, The task that I was assigned was to teach these kids English, but I didn't know their local language. So I would grab a ball and hold it up and say, this is a ball, and they would look back at me and go, This is a ball with these eager, expectant smiles. And then later in the day, one of them would grab a pencil or a crayon and hold it up and say, this is a ball. (laughs) 
Needless to say, I was in over my head. I was surrounded with more poverty and more need than I had ever seen or experienced. The students I was falling in love with would come to school hungry with distended bellies for malnutrition and lifeless eyes. I would panic and scramble and think, we have to get these children something to eat. I would notice that they would come to school with fevers even though they had had to walk miles to get there. They would be dirty and they would be sick and I would go to the pastor I was living with and beg him, we have to find a way to get them some medicine. I would see the hopelessness, the discouragement that comes from living every day in poverty and the beauty in their little faces, the ways innocent children had stopped smiling because of terrible life circumstances. And I knew we had to give these children some hope. We had to teach them about Jesus. And so that's what I began to do. I called my parents back home and asked them for a little more money. And I asked them to ask their friends to share too. I started providing nutritious breakfasts for the kids that came to school and paying for their bills at a local clinic if they came in sick. When the students from my kindergarten went home each day around lunch, I would spend my afternoons and evenings hanging out with the 120 children who lived at the orphanage where I was living. With only eight staff members, they were hungry for attention. And so they told me their stories. I came to know and love these kids, and they shared about themselves with me. And as I came to know them, I learned that many of them had parents or grandparents, or aunts, or uncles living near my, nearby. And so this was fascinating and honestly strange to me. I think coming from America, I had thought that in order to live in an orphanage, both of your parents had to have died. As it turns out though, roughly 80% of children living in institutionalized care in East Africa have at least one living parent. And the majority of those who don't have a living parent have another family member, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle who loves them and might even be willing to care for them, but they can't afford it. The families in my community saw that the children who lived at the orphanage got to go to school. They got to eat three times a day. They got to go to the doctor when they were sick. School isn't free in Uganda, you have to pay. And the average family might have anywhere from four to seven children. So you're paying for each one of those children to go to school. Many of the people in my community didn't make money as they worked. They, they farmed and they grew their own food and their payment for their work was the food that they took home to eat. But they didn't have money to pay for school fees. And so the solution was to send your children to the orphanage so that they could get an education. And this wasn't okay with me. I talked to the locals, I talked to my friends, I did some math. The next time a grandmother came to the orphanage seeking a placement for her twin granddaughters, I asked her if she might be willing to keep them at home with her if I would pay for them to go to school, which as it turns out was gonna be roughly $30 a month. Tears of joy filled her eyes. She said to me, bringing them here today was the hardest thing that I've ever done, but I thought they would be better off. As I hugged that grandmother, I knew what God was calling me to do with my life. I asked my translator to help me identify other children in the community who might be at risk of coming to live in the orphanage, who weren't able to go to school. I called home again and I asked my parents to start spreading the word. Before I knew it, I had a list on a piece of notebook paper with 40 children. There they are. <laughs> with 40 children who would be starting school for the first time ever. And I began at 19 years old to fill out paperwork to start a nonprofit so these children could continue to have their needs met. As I prayed, I felt that God continued to impress the verse John 8, 32 on my heart. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I knew that I didn't just want these children and these communities to be well-educated and well-fed. I wanted them to know 
Jesus. I didn't just want these kids to be able to afford school and a doctor's visit when they were sick. I wanted them to fall in love with their Savior and one day live with him forever. I named my little ministry Amazima, which is the Luganda word for truth. Every Friday evening, these 40 students that I was paying school fees for would join me on my small cement front porch and we would worship God and study the Bible together. We would cook beans and rice over a big open fire and eat together before they went home. I was passionate and I was excited. I was running hard and fast for him and with him. And as he swung the doors wide open, I fell more and more in love with him and with a life of obedience to him, no matter the cost. At the time, I didn't know the joy and the beauty that would find me in a life poured out for God. I also didn't know the pain that awaited me on the other side of the ocean, on the other side of humility, where I would recognize just how little I had to offer. I didn't know that I would carry the responsibility of looking into a mother's face and telling her that her child was not going to live. I didn't know that I would forge deep friendships with people imprisoned by addiction that I could not help them fight no matter how hard I tried. I didn't know that I would provide care for months at a time for people living with HIV, desperately begging God to spare their lives, only later to find myself holding their hands as they slipped into eternity with him. I didn't know the loneliness that would come from living a life of obedience, seemingly all alone. I would come home from a long day of teaching and have absolutely no one to share with. My Ugandan host family was amazing, but this was their normal day-to-day life. They didn't relate to my experience. Months later, once I found my own home and had newly adopted daughters, I would put them in bed and sit in the silence and let the tears fall as I realized just how utterly unequipped I was to meet all of the needs around me. And I didn't know in the middle of such deep pain and grief and loss that I would experience a joy and a peace that far surpassed human understanding. The Lord would take the darkest the loneliest, the most difficult places of my life and make them places where I knew him more intimately and more deeply than I ever thought possible. In the middle of a hurricane that surrounded me, I would experience a comfort so deep, so clear that it simply could not be denied. It was Jesus. He was near to me as I followed him in obedience. In the middle of my inadequacy, my fear, my loneliness, the Lord wooed my heart. He drew me to himself and spoke his love over me in a way that I have never known before. In the absence of friends and family, he was all that I had to lean on. And he taught me that he is all I need. When God didn't give me what I wanted, what I begged for in prayer, he gave me something else. He gave me more of himself. This little group of 40 children grew. I paid more school fees and I cooked more beans. We cried when things were hard and we laughed when things were good and we marveled at a God who loved us through it all. We grew and we grew until we could no longer fit on my little front porch. In fact, we could no longer fit in my yard. So I bought a piece of property down the road in our community. There we would meet under a big mango tree for worship and we would cook our beans and rice over a fire. When, we couldn't, when I couldn't lead enough small group Bible studies on my own, I enlisted my Ugandan friends to help. Eventually, I hired them on full time as a Mazima staff. Our little tribe grew and grew and grew and grew. We built buildings, a chapel, a kitchen, latrines, a playground where the kids could run and play, a clinic where they could receive medical attention, a safe place where their parents and guardians could gather to celebrate. 
And in the midst of all of it, God began to grow my family too. When the grandmother of three little girls that I had been sending to school died, I invited them to sleep at my house for the night while we looked for another relative they could stay with. We looked for months, but were unable to find anybody willing or able to care for them. So I eventually met with the local government social worker and began to fill out paperwork to foster them myself. Eventually, I adopted these three little girls and 10 others who came to live with me over the years. (laughs) That always gets a laugh. (laughs) They were my little partners in ministry, helping me prepare food for the children who came over on Saturday, handing me supplies when a wound needed bandaging, or helping me make beds for our sick and dying neighbors who would come stay in our guest room over the years. Needless to say, My gap year never really ended. (laughs) After seven years of single parenting, after I had long given up hope of ever being married, I met my husband, Benji. He had been living and ministering in the same community in Uganda, discipling young men for several years, and we'd become good friends. And because God has a really good sense of humor, though we had never met in the U.S., Benji is actually from a town just 10 minutes south of where I grew up. (laughs) My testimony is one of God's unchanging faithfulness, unfailing love, and undeniable provision of my every need and even sometimes of the desires of my heart. Benji and I went on to add two biological children to our crew, both boys. And if you're doing the math, that's a grand total of 15 many of whom are adults now. But you know, I wasn't planning to turn around, but I I look at this picture and I don't think I've ever seen it that big. (laughs) It's it's the screensaver on my phone, but it's really small and I just, um, wow. God has been so, so good to me. Um, And that picture right there is just proof of what he can do with a surrendered life, with a life of obedience. We were singing that song, right, that we raise up our hands and we lay down our lives. And, and that's not just a one-time choice to move to a different country. That's an every single day choice that today, Lord, I lay down my life. And if you leave with nothing else, I hope you know that he can do something so beautiful with a life surrendered to him. I loved every second of my life in Uganda. I fell more in love with Jesus there. Our community was small and we knew almost everyone in our little community and they knew us. And then a little over three years ago, one of our loved ones faced a health crisis that basically turned our lives upside down. At first, we tried to manage it from overseas. My husband traveled back and forth across the ocean while I stayed home with a nursing infant who didn't have a passport yet and the rest of our kids. Just a few months later, COVID showed up and basically shut down the world. In Uganda, not only were we not allowed to fly in and out of the country anymore, we weren't even allowed to drive our cars. And just when we were finally coming up for air, Just when I finally thought I knew what the next few months would look like, illness again reared its ugly head in our family and had us flying back and forth between Uganda and the U.S. again. Ultimately, last year on what was supposed to be just a three-week visit to the United States, after lots and lots of prayer, lots of open doors here, lots of closed doors there, we decided to stay in the United States to move our family to a new country and culture without our things, without our community. And there I was in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, feeling almost exactly as I had 15 years prior in Uganda, feeling just as naive and unprepared as I had looking over the sea of little faces in my very first classroom, feeling just as lonely as I had as a single parent tucking my babies into bed. For weeks that turned into months, I opened my eyes in a bedroom that wasn't mine, in a house that wasn't mine, 
in a country that I was born into, but now felt completely foreign. And in, even, in order to even get out of bed, I had to beg God for courage. I had to beg him to be my sufficiency the way that he had been for all those years, all the way over on the other side of the world, because I simply could not do this on my own. And I don't know what your current life situation is. I don't know what you walked in here carrying. And I know that sometimes I can stand up on a stage and share my life story about going to this distant and foreign place and adopting all these kids and it can feel a little bit unrelatable or it can feel like, oh wow, God did such big things in her life. But the truth is we are all just in need, just as in need of his grace and his sustenance. We are all just as in need of him to be our sufficiency. I don't know what you came here facing tonight, but I know who God has been in my own life, and so I know that he'll be the same loving father to you. I know that he will be faithful to you, and I know that he will give you the courage you need to face today and tomorrow and the next day. And so I want to open up the word together tonight to one of my favorite stories in the book of Genesis. It's in Genesis chapter 22. And the story starts by saying that God decided to test Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, the son that I have given you, Isaac. And go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering to me on the mountain that I will show you. The scripture says that early the next morning, Abraham got up and Abraham loaded up his donkey. And I feel like maybe there's a section missing there. That's it. He just, he got up and he loaded up his donkey and it seems like there was no conversation and there was no argument. Can you imagine? I know that if this was me, I would have been kicking and screaming. In fact, if, if the last year is any evidence, I, I definitely would have been kicking and screaming. I mean, can you imagine the questions that Abraham has? when God asks him to surrender the very thing that God has just given him? Can you imagine the pain and the confusion of Abraham as he loads up his donkey, as he treks up the pebbly mountain with his beloved son walking beside him? This is the son he had prayed for, for years and years, the son that God had given him in his old age. This is the son that God had promised to him to make him a great nation. He had promised an everlasting covenant to Abraham's son, Isaac. And now he was going to take him away. And Abraham, faithfully, courageously, he loads up that donkey and he climbs up the mountain. Have you ever been there? looking at your own plans, the things you thought God had promised to give you, the things you thought were going to happen, and just wondering, how? How will you ask this of me, God? How will I do this, God? Do you wish that you had Abraham's blind and crazy trust, this kind of resolute courage and obedience? I do too. And I imagine Isaac plodding along next to his father, and it says he's carrying the firewood on his back. Genesis says that Abraham carried the knife and the fire, and I wonder if his hands trembled with the unknown, with the weight of what the Lord had asked of him. And Isaac wasn't a little kid at this point either, the way it's written in some of our children's Bibles. Isaac would have been a young man, And it's likely that he'd gone with his father on many trips like this to make many sacrifices. And he realizes something's different. 
So Isaac speaks up to his father. Father, he says. Yes, my son, Abraham replies. Well, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac says. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God himself will provide what we need to surrender what we want in order to follow him. And I, I just can't get over Abraham's certainty. Oh, God will provide the lamb, right? It's a bold claim that he makes. He can't see any evidence of that yet but he's so sure because God has provided for him over and over and over again. And God has kept his promises to Abraham over and over again. And so Abraham can trust him. And that's the only thing that got me through this last weird year of living in America where people are in their cars and they got their earbuds in and they're looking at their screen and you can't get to know anybody the way you do walking through little village dirt roads. Is that if I could trust God before and if I could move as an 18 year old to the other side of the world and God could bring me my husband from my hometown to Uganda and God could give me 13 beautiful girls and then two little boys. And let me tell you, when we found out Noah, the first one was a boy, I said, I don't know what to do with a boy. <laughs> but then when we found out I was pregnant a second time, I said, oh, please, Lord, let it be a boy. Let this child have a brother. <laughs> Down at the end of all these sisters. And so when he asked me to surrender, the very thing that had at one time been his plan for my life, the thing that I loved the most in the world, I knew that I could trust him. And so I ask myself a lot, do I trust God as much as Abraham? You know, it says that Abraham trusted in the Lord and that's what was credited to him as righteousness. And I know that Jesus has given me righteousness and so that means that Jesus can give me the ability to trust God this much. That I can trust that no matter what my mountain is, no matter how seemingly steep or hopeless the road looks, no matter how the pebbles slip under my feet as I trudge onward, God will provide. That no matter what I've been asked to lay down, what I've been asked to sacrifice, God will provide. God will provide the strength God will provide the grace. God will provide the way. That's what real courage is, isn't it? To look up at our mountains, whatever they are, and to trust him and proclaim that God will be enough because he will always provide more of himself. I've known this to be true. This is my story and I can testify that no matter the mountain, no matter the surrender, no matter the cost, God who sent his son to die for you will not leave you and will never stop loving you. So Abraham builds his altar. He piles it with wood. He binds his son there. Like he's pretty far into this process. His trust in God to provide a way out is unimaginable. And just as he lifts his hand, the word says he hears a voice calling his name, stopping him, instructing him to lay aside the knife. It says, and Abraham looked, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns. A replacement, a sacrifice, just in the nick of time. And sometimes we feel like the one carrying the knife, climbing the mountain, 
with our faces set against the wind, wondering all the long way why God would call us to this or how he could ask this impossible thing of us. So I wanna challenge you today. I wanna ask you, where is your Mount Moriah? Maybe it's your church or your ministry or your family and your home life and you feel like you've hit a wall, a climb so steep and you're exhausted and you aren't even sure you can keep doing this. Or perhaps your Mount Moriah is a relationship with a spouse or your children or a friend or even a stranger who you know you're called to love, but they aren't easy to love. And it can be lonely on this mountain road trying to be faithful to what God is asking of you. Maybe you've got big plans and hopes and dreams and the doors are closing and you're wondering, God, would you ask me to surrender this? But I think that it could be that what God is most after is our surrendered obedience, our laying down of our lives and our plans and our opening our hands to what he has for us. Could it be that he doesn't want our leadership skills or our organization or our big plans or our dreams or our service as much as he just wants our hearts, our hearts? Over the years, God brought me from a place where I was sacrificing everything comfortable and familiar to go and live and work in Africa to a place where I was lonely and isolated and overwhelmed and then into a season where my ministry was booming and growing and supporting hundreds and thousands of children and operating schools and programs of all different kinds. And then about six years ago, God put it on my heart to really step back from ministry and focus on my family. Let other people run Amazima. And I started just doing all the things um, that it takes to be a stay-at-home mom. I went from daily watching people's lives transformed um, to chopping vegetables and folding laundry in my kitchen. And it seemed a little bit less glamorous and a little bit less miraculous, helping with homework, navigating sibling rivalries. I've gone from what the world might consider big ministry to being faithful in the small, everyday ministry that's inside my home, shepherding my family to him. And through it all, he has been so faithful to meet me and give me the courage and the hope and the perseverance that I need for this season. And then again last year, he asked me to lay all that down. I woke up in our Tennessee rental house and realized that the things that had always defined me weren't true of me anymore, at least not today. I was no longer a missionary living in a foreign country. I was no longer the wife of a pastor because my husband wasn't pastoring our church anymore. I wasn't the woman who hosted church in her yard and Bible studies in her living room. I wasn't the lady who threw the best birthday parties and baby showers and women's conferences and who won the town's community chili cook-off every year with white chicken chili. I didn't walk into my kid's school as the founder or director or administrator. I didn't walk into the coffee shop where they already knew my order. I had to sacrifice again the other way around. That had become my home, my familiar, my comfortable. And then he asked us to move here. But no matter what mountain he has called me to climb, no matter what he has called me to surrender, he has been sufficient. And I could tell story after story, and I did over dinner, just of all the different ways he provided for our family to be here, from schools for my children to a rental house that we could afford to live in, which is not easy in Nashville right now. Um, we are so loved, and it is his deep, desire to provide for us. And Abraham knew a secret that God has been kind to teach me over the years. Back several chapters in Genesis chapter 15, God has said to Abraham, Abraham, do not be afraid. 
I am your shield, your very great reward. And that's it. That no matter what the mountain is, no matter what the surrender is, no matter what plans or dreams we have to lay aside, no matter what prayers seem to go unanswered, the mountain journey always brings us closer to God. And He is our shield and our very great reward. What might He be calling you into today? What might He be asking you to step away from today? It might seem big and scary, or it might feel ordinary and boring. It might be that our day-to-day faithfulness over and over again in the little things takes the greatest courage of all. But what I know of each of us is that he's calling us to trust him. To look up the mountain and to tremble, but don't let it stop you. To walk that mountain road anyway, knowing that God's way is better and ultimately He will provide the very best. He will provide his son. He has provided his son as a sacrifice in our place. So this is my testimony tonight, and I pray that it's yours too, that no matter what, no matter what God may call you to, no matter what he may call you away from, no matter what gifts or blessings he'll pour out on your life and no matter what he takes away, he is the greatest reward that we could ever behold. And because of Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, our eternity is secure with him. And we can fix our eyes on him. We can look into his wonderful face. God has given us a ram in the thicket. He has given us himself, and he is our very, very great reward. So I'd love to spend some time just praying over you guys this evening. And then as we close, if any of you just want extra prayer, you can stay in your seat and raise your hand, and somebody will just come and pray with you. But thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm going to pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you so much for your goodness to us, Father. It is so much greater than anything we could ever ask or imagine, Lord. We thank you for pouring out your grace. We thank you for Jesus, the sacrifice that you gave in our place to wash us of all of our sin and to draw us into relationship with you, Father. And if there is anyone in this room who is running from you. God, I pray that they would hear your voice tonight. I pray that your daughter would hear your voice calling you back, to, calling her back to yourself, Father. And if there is anyone in this room tonight, Father, like I have been, Father, holding on to the thing that we love, the thing that you gave us, and you're asking them to surrender. Father, I pray that you would just give them the grace to let go and trust that whatever you have up ahead, it's better, God. Because being with you is always better, God, even when it's hard. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone in here who is just on the edge of something something that's hard, Father, of stepping into something that feels scary, God, and they feel like they don't have the courage to do it. Father, I pray that they would know that courage can be just to take the next step, Lord. That you're right there, that you hold our hands, that you go with us and you go before us, Father, and that you will provide what they need every step of the way. God, more than anything else, we long for nearness to you. God, make it true. Make it true that our greatest desire is to be near to you, Father to behold your face, to behold your miracles on this earth, Father, to be vessels that point others to you, Father. Make it true of us that the very greatest reward we could ever imagine 
is to be with you. Father, as we behold your face, would everything else become dim, Lord, in light of your glory, Father. God, I thank you. I thank you for how you have been faithful to me on the days when I've been faithful and on the days when I haven't, Father. And I pray that you would give each one of us in this room a heart of obedience, Father, to follow you wherever you lead, to walk up whatever mountain, God, because you are with us. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we thank you that by his sacrifice, by his blood, we have the promise of living with you in eternity. God, would every person in this room feel your love for them tonight, Father? Would they look to you and would they see that you are looking back at us, God, with joy in your eyes, saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.